Okay, now you're seeing my screen. Yeah. Yep. Now we're ready to go. Good. Thank okay. God. Now we're cooking now. <laughs> Good. Okay. Good. And this is this is um, going to be interesting because this is um, the you know. Uh, of the stuff that I have presented, this is the one with the most uh, content in it. So the fact that we're starting more than half an hour late <laughs> is uh, probably a bad idea. Uh, however, this is security implications of quantum computing. Um, a little bit of introduction. Oh, and, and since... Um, We've got it here. Let me see. I've got get the chat and see if I can do that. No. Okay. I'll have to pick it up. Uh, where are we here? There we go. Okay. So. Okay. There's the uh, the details in in the chat screen. If you. Uh, want to do, uh, you know, pick up those things. But anyways, that's um, uh, sort of the introduction to a set of blog postings that I did uh, some years back. That was five years ago. Um, and uh, so that's got a little extra um, detail and, and introduction uh, to what this is doing. Uh, because Quantum computing, well, quantum mechanics, um, uh, I think it was Niels Bohr who said that anybody who can, uh, who thinks they understand it and their brain doesn't hurt, doesn't understand it. Uh, so it's, you know, quantum computing is, is really, really interesting stuff. We definitely do not have an awful lot of an idea of what it um, really means, but in, in terms of, you know, not to get into the, the quantum physics and, and quantum mechanics stuff, but flowing out of the, the basic concepts there, we have the idea of the qubit. Now, we have um, bits in computers. Uh, we deal with bits. Um, quantum computers deal with qubits. And the in in a, a bit is either a one or a zero. A qubit can be one and zero at the same time, okay. un, until we uh, determine what what it's ultimately going to be, and and that's you know the determination is is what goes into quantum programming. Um, uh, it this gets a little bit hairy because it can not only be one and zero at the same time, but any value in between um, in certain situations. So, you know, we won't get into that right now. We'll just say that it can be one and zero at the same time. What this allows us to do with, with sufficiently many qubits is to set up a situation where we can run through all possible values at the same time and find out which ones fit. Um, that's, that's basically what we uh, talk about. Um, there's the, uh, you know, we, we have all kinds of weird things about quantum mechanics and, and quantum uh, computing. Uh, there's the observer effect. Um, you know, Schrodinger's cat is both alive and dead at the same time. And Schrodinger's phone, until you look, it's both cracked and not cracked at the same time um, and, and stuff like that. But there's also an, an issue called entanglement. And we're going to touch on that um, slightly in, in one of these things in, in terms of networking. Um, but the entanglement of multiple qubits is, is what gives us the opportunity to perform the same function on a bunch of qubits. And again, as I say, sort of find out which answer it is that actually fits with, with one operation. And here's the, the Bohr quote that I was saying. If someone says that he can talk, think or talk about quantum physics without becoming dizzy, that shows only that he has not understood anything whatever about it. So, <laughs> you know, we'll 
uh, do that. Now, one of the aspects of uh, quantum technology with computers is that um, we can have uh, quantum technology to aid us in producing traditional computers. So we're, we're making uh, chips um, and, and elements on the chips smaller and faster, and we're getting into the quantum size range where, where there are quantum effects in what we're doing with, with chips and traces and, and that sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, we, we need to address that. Um, there's also the fact that uh, one of the things that, that Turing uh, figured out with um, his uh, ideas of, of computing, starting us all off here, is that irreversible computations, and that's, you know, in traditional computers, they um, have a sort of a, a minimum limit. And, and so we're reading, you know, reaching the, the limits in terms of um, how much we can reduce the power consumption with traditional uh, computers. But with quantum operations, we can do reversible computations. And in that case, you can make the, the power arbitrarily small. And uh, so again, we can build a traditional computer with very low power consumption um, if we're using uh, quantum technology properly. Um, there's also, uh, there's quantum cryptography and, and quantum cryptography is a real thing, but it keeps on getting mixed up with the idea of using quantum computers for decryption, a sort of a universal decryption. And, and people are saying, oh, you know, quantum computers are going to kill cryptography as we know it. And, and that is not the case. Um, and we'll talk about that in, in a, uh, second here, but quantum cryptography, I, I do want to mention and, and, and disentangle it from this quantum decryption thing. Quantum cryptography is not cryptography. Um, it is uh, basically just key exchange. And I, you know, have a, a demo that we could do, but it takes half an hour and we don't have time tonight. So um, we won't, we won't do that. But um, it is being used, I mean, uh, a bunch of Swiss banks have been using it, and there are a bunch of uh, commercial enterprises that will sell this quantum um, cryptography stuff, which, as I say, has nothing, well, has to do with cryptography, but only in terms of key exchange. And I mean, basically, you need dedicated single mode fiber optic cable um, to do this key exchange. And if you've got dedicated single mode fiber optic cable, why do you need cryptography for crying out loud? So uh, anyways, but um, you know, it's, it is something that is unfortunately in here and, and gets mixed up with everything else. And, and um, you know, it's real, but actually a lot more limited than um, uh, people. It, it's very elegant. It's a, a really elegant uh, idea. It just doesn't work in the real world. As I said, you know, it's always implementation uh, in cryptography. It, it, it's always the implementation that gets attacked. And, and there's all kinds of implementation attacks on quantum cryptography, unfortunately. So, but quantum decryption, that's just hypothesized. It's going to be a long time before we see it. And by that time, we'll have uh, uh, decent uh, quantum computing proof uh, algorithms for cryptography. So, well, yeah. Um, anyways, the, the thing is um, with quantum computing, there's also, is it a real true quantum computer? <clears throat> and there are uh, various uh, quantum computers, um, uh, fairly small. I think the, the largest of them is only barely into the, uh, you know, three orders of magnitude qubit range, um, you know, just over 100 qubits. And that isn't enough to do an awful lot of really interesting stuff. So those are only sort of test beds for the moment. Um, and then there's D-Wave over in Burnaby here. And 
Uh, D-Wave um, has got something, but it's more of a quantum coprocessor. Um, it's like an analog computer. I mean, you know, we, we know digital computers, but we have had analog computers. And, and so, you know, what are analog computers? Well, there's the spaghetti computer, which does parallel sorting. Um, you cut uh, pieces of spaghetti to the, you know, numbers that you want to sort. And then in one application, bang, you sort them all. And, you know, it's done. It's a special purpose. It has a single application. But there, it's very effective. Um, same thing with the slide rule. We do exact computations, but it's a little imprecise in terms of how we read it. Um, the D-Wave computer is an adiabatic quantum computer. It looks for a situation where it gets the least energy and therefore the best answer. Uh, least path, best comparison simulation. So the, uh, the D-Wave Orion machines, they are not full uh, quantum computers there, um, you know, they have some, some very interesting, um, uh, capabilities, um, but it is at best, uh, sort of a quantum coprocessor. That's, uh, the general idea. So having provided some of that as a, a background, um, let's get into, uh, specific applications and, and what we can do with quantum computing in terms of security. Um, and I, I've structured this by the domains of security to have a, you know, give it a little bit of format uh, when we do it. But the general functions that we're going to be looking at here are the, the same ones that, that the D-Wave can do. And that is looking at least path calculations, doing simulations, uh, doing pattern matching. And the least path problems, um, the, the big one, uh, big example that people use is the traveling salesman problem. And uh, for example, there's like 28,000 cities and towns in Norway. And um, they, uh, the traveling salesman problem, you know, if you've only got two sites to visit, it's easier to see which is the shortest path. It's just, you know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, you know, one straight line. But as you start adding um, different places to go, then what's the, you know, the best path to, to get to all the places? That's the traveling salesman problem. Um, and uh, this is not something can, that can be done um, easily with, with a traditional computer. As I say, there's 28,000 uh, towns in Norway. They did the traveling salesman problem. Um, I believe that it took like 10 or 11 years um, using, you know, multiple network high-speed computers to actually do this. Um, whereas you, you get a big enough, you know, quantum computer, you can do it, you know, one, one operation type of thing. Uh, simulation, um, there's, there's all kinds of things that, that we can run with simulation. Um, uh, climate models, weather maps, um, you know, those types of things are uh, a really good example. The thing is that when you're doing weather and climate simulations, you divide up the atmosphere into a whole bunch of cells and you do calculations on each cell. And then because those calculations have changed the results in all of those cells, then you have to go back and redo the calculations based on the new uh, information from the surrounding cells for, for every cell type of thing. And, and so it's over and over again. There's an awful lot of uh, cells, therefore there's an awful lot of processing and, and you know, it just takes a lot of time. Again, with a quantum computer, you're able to do this you know, big enough quantum computer, you're able to do this sort of one shot. And, and so you can get closer to real time stuff and, and you know, much more accurate and therefore longer range forecasts. Now, um, the other uh, thing that we are really good at and traditional computers are not is pattern recognition. Now there's a, you know, picture there of, of airplanes, you're, you know, immediately you as a person look at that and, and without even, you know, fully, concentrating on it, you probably immediately think, you know, airplanes and, and then possibly even military airplanes and that sort of thing. Whereas it would take a computer a long time to figure that out. 
um, people are good at this, computers are bad, but the, uh, the quantum computers are going to be much better at recognition. And, and so that, that type of thing that we want uh, computers to be able to do um, is going to be much easier with uh, uh, quantum computers. So uh, into the domains of security and, and what we can do with them. Risk management, um, and again, uh, this is you know shortest path traveling salesman type type of problem uh, because when we're doing risk management, the tools that we've got for risk management, um, we uh, you know put in all the data, collect all the data on the risks, on the threats, the the probabilities, the impacts, and then the uh, uh, efficient you know efficacy of different uh, types of controls that we're gonna put in place to counter, to mitigate the risks. W once we've collected all that data, we can then put it into sort of a giant spreadsheet and we can start playing around. What if um, we put a little bit of more effort or more resources into this control and reduce it in that? Because of course you've all got a fixed you know, security budget. And uh, so what, you know, uh, does this give us a better outcome? Does, does you know, that trade-off us, give us a better outcome? But we've got to do all the shuffling of, of you know, uh, increasing this and, and decreasing that um, and, and see if it gives us a better result. Now, uh, what the quantum computers, and again, you know, once we get big enough ones, will allow us to do is collect all that data, put it in, and the quantum computer will be able to do that, the least energy, shortest path type analysis, and tell us, you know, what's the optimum arrangement um, the optimum configuration, the most efficient, the most effective, the, the most cost effective, uh, greatest benefit for uh, the fixed cost for our uh, various controls, for all the different risks that we have. Uh, so again, it'll, it'll sort of be a one shot bang and, and you get your answer type of thing, uh, which right now is, is just not possible. Uh, information classification, pattern matching is, is going to help us there, the, the pattern matching capabilities of quantum computers. Um, uh, risk assessment is uh, not uh, something that people look forward to, like, like we said in the, in the risk management area, um, but we're going to have to do some thought here. Um, is it going to be worth investing or not in quantum computing? And again, um, figuring out how the, you know, what it can do for us and, and what the benefits are is going to be part of that decision as to whether or not we're going to get into the field of quantum computing for those benefits. Um, in terms of security architecture, the, the news here is probably all, all bad. Um, this is going to give us new architectures. It's going to be much more complex. Um, it's going to introduce new vulnerabilities, just a whole bunch of work uh, that we need to do in, in regard to that, simply because somebody might want to put a quantum computer into our company. Um, but it does give us a simulation of vulnerabilities and, and protections, um, allowing us to, to sort of test out um, whether or not uh, given protections or safeguards are going to help us um, in uh, certain situations. Um, quantum uh, devices are going to, uh, they are subject, uh, quite subject, unfortunately, uh, to issues of noise. And uh, that is, going to be something that we're going to have to, to look at and, and address in a variety of different ways. Um, right now, the D-Wave, um, they, uh, you know, they've, they've tried to reduce noise as much as possible, but basically um, what they do with their uh, 
uh, systems is, is just, you know, sort of vote, run multiple times and, and see if they get the same answer multiple times. So uh, there, there are uh, new technologies in terms of quantum error correction. Uh, again, uh, going back to the issue of entanglement. Um, and that may give us some promise in terms of uh, fault tolerant uh, computing. So it's an area to, to be addressed there. Um, in the field of access control, biometrics, um, we uh, really, in terms of biometrics, um, up until this point, um, we're using just, you know, interesting forms of data representation, um, but we're losing an, an awful lot of the data. And, and so that uh, has implications for our error rates for uh, false positives and, and false negatives. Um, in terms of biometrics, uh, the, the pattern matching capability of quantum computing is, is going to allow us um, more freedom there and, and more ability to say, uh, well, yeah, that sure looks like it's, you know, Vern's uh, login or face or, or fingerprints or, or whatever it is, um, even though it's not quite right. And, and so that uh, pattern matching capability is, is probably going to assist us there. Um, there, uh, in terms of the uh, both the least path and the simulation uh, capabilities, information flow, um, which is very time consuming right now, and, and covert channel analysis, which again is, is something that's, that's hard to figure out. Um, is uh, probably much more possible with quantum computers. And again, in intrusion detection, we've, we've got our intrusion detection systems. Um, the pattern matching capabilities um, is probably going to make those a lot more effective. So, ah, cryptography. Again, now, uh, as I say, you know, we've, we've got all the things about um, the uh, the quantum computing, which really is only the uh, key negotiation, key exchange. Um, it's uh, the BB84 uh, uh, protocol. It's uh, you know it, tremendously elegant, wonderful. It it uh, is able to detect eavesdropping for the first time. All of that is in in terms of the theory, but. Um, in terms of the implementation, there's just been all kinds of ways to attack that, unfortunately. Um, the issue of being able to do um, sort of parallel decryption all in one step, do brute force attacks that just drop the right key out of the system, um, that, uh, that is limited to um, uh, the shore algorithm and and others that may uh, use mod functions. Um, so it's um, you know right now it, it's basically uh, RSA uh, is susceptible to that, and uh, there are new algorithms that are being pursued um, to uh, you know make sure that uh, they you know they have a high work factor both when you're doing uh, classical types of cryptanalysis and uh, the quantum cryptanalysis as well. Um, the one of the really, really important things in cryptography, of course, is randomness. And um, quantum computers actually can can help us there. Um, on the one hand, because they are so subject to noise, um, you know, we can just use the noise as a, a source of randomness. But there's also, for the first time, I mean, you know, John Wayman said that uh, anybody who thinks of arithmetic methods of, of generating randomness is in a state of sin. But um, the thing is that there are things we can do with quantum devices that can give us genuinely random answers. And um, in a sense, tunably random. We, we can take something that, um, uh, has a, a, a random output and sort of tweak the bias on it. So if we've got another system that is generating random stuff, but it has a bit of a bias, we can tweak the bias in the other direction um, and, and sort of use these two together um, 
and and come up with a, a balanced uh, source of uh, random data. And again, you know, cryptography desperately needs random data all the time. Um, analysis of the implementation problems. Uh, like I say, you know, you always attack cryptography in implementation and quantum computing simulations uh, will probably be able to help us to identify uh, those issues. Uh, in physical, um, it, this is this is really interesting. Again, you know the noise, uh, radio frequency interference, electromagnetic interference, um, all of that stuff is is a problem and and needs to be addressed. But the big one, um, possibly depending on on which technology uh, eventually gets um, used in this regard, is temperature. The the Orion uh, computer. Well, it it's you know running at at super cold uh, temperatures. Room temperature is a hundred times as hot as interstellar space. But when the Orion computer is operating, interstellar space is a thousand times as hot as the central core of the Orion device. You know, that's that's how cold we have to get uh, for some of these operations. That has implications. I mean, you know, we have to keep the uh, you know the power considerations um, in some of the technologies uh, to create qubits for quantum computing. Um, if you lose power, you just lose whatever process you're working on right now. You actually lose your CPU because you know you've got lattices of of photons or electrons bouncing around in, in channels in, in laser guides and, and things like that. So um, it's, you know, it, it's a non-trivial task sometimes to, to keep these things. And, and uh, so, you know, power, uh, heat and cooling, um, you know, all of these issues are, are going to have to be addressed uh, for operating uh, quantum computers. Uh, so there's going to be special costs. There's going to be special protections for devices. Um, and uh, you're probably going to want to deal with uh, physical access control. You know, who's who's going to get access to this? So. Now, business impact analysis. Um, this, uh, I, I've got to admit, be, I mean, you know, business impact, uh, sorry, business impact analysis and, and business continuity planning, disaster recovery planning. Um, this is close to my heart because of course, of all my work in, in emergency management. Um, and doing a business impact analysis, what's most crucial? What's your most you know, crucial? What, what are your various uh, critical business units um, and systems and that sort of thing? Um, the least path analysis part of uh, you know, quantum computing capabilities is, is definitely going to assist us there. Um, the simulation part will uh, very much help us with the testing of business continuity plans and, and whether or not they're effective, whether or not we've, we've missed anything out. Uh, but um, it, they, what really is interesting to me is, is the disaster management. Again, like the risk management, um, in a disaster, you want to direct resources to maximum effect, and that you know it saves lives. It um, uh, helps people to uh, uh, you know. Well, it, it reduces the suffering. Um, you know, so there's there's all kinds of really good stuff that can happen if you do proper management in the middle of a disaster, and uh, like I said, you know, the, the uh, risk management that can be done, that has to be done, um, the calculations are very complex and generally take time to perform with a traditional computer because there's so many different moving parts. Well, when you've got a simulation situation, um, you're able to do those calculations in real time. So while the hurricane is going on 
And when it hits land 20 miles away from where you thought it was going to hit land, um, you've got a whole bunch of things that are in the wrong place. But with quantum computing, you can correct that very quickly and also address issues of what do we do to, to move those resources, um, to redirect those resources to where they are going to be most needed. Uh, you know, as soon as possible. Um, again, uh, the uh, continuity of operations for, for these special devices is definitely going to be an issue. Um, the, uh, you know, talking about the power, talking about the cooling, um, you know, what, what is going to happen uh, if there's failures there. Now, in terms of uh, application security, uh, testing of our increasingly complex uh, applications um, is a non-trivial task and, and one where quantum computers will, will definitely be able to uh, assist us and, and give us better uh, information. Uh, database analysis, uh, the, again, the pattern matching capabilities will help us. Um, and looking, you know, as I talked about in, in terms of the differential privacy, the cost of, of privacy versus the benefit of, of safety um, and some of those calculations, uh, a database aggregation problem analysis. And again, um, the, the uh, privacy budget, privacy accounting calculations um, that uh, differential privacy is uh, uh, meant to address um, will, you know, they're going to be very complex. And, and so uh, quantum computers are probably going to be an area that will uh, assist us in there. Um, learning, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, the, the pattern matching capabilities of quantum computing are, are probably going to be uh, very useful, uh, give us new insights in there. And the thing is that right now we've got, you know, when, when we're trying to check the output of, of a, a neural network, say, or of a genetic computing uh, operation, um, because those are systems that are going beyond what traditional computers are capable of, how do we have a check on, on what they're doing? Well, um, quantum computing gives us those same capabilities coming at it from a different perspective. And, and so um, again, as, as with the voting in the Orion systems, probably you know running a neural net, running a, a quantum computing uh, uh, assessment um, and, and seeing whether or not they agree is um, at least an, a, a first attempt at trying to check some of these things that, uh, um, that we want to know about. Um, again, as I say, you know, uh, we uh, traditionally say, you know, check the output against what you expected. Well, you know, with a lot of these artificial intelligence things, it's, um, you know, it, what did we expect? We, you know, we, the reason that we're doing them is because we wanted to, to get results that we didn't expect. Um, and so, you know, but when we get quantum computing in there and, and start looking at those results, how are we going to check them? You know, those things are, are things that were going to be impossible to, to compute by classical methods. And so, you know, how are we going to test uh, whether or not this is actually working? Um, malware, uh, botnet detection, uh, as per the intrusion detection, the pattern matching capabilities um, is uh, going to uh, allow us um, better uh, analysis there. Uh, also, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, both malware, uh, looking at, you know, what family does this come from, uh, and therefore tying it back to, you know, what, what group, what uh, possibly even individual um, is the person who wrote this, 
uh, but certainly in terms of, of botnets out on the internet, uh, looking at the control and own ownership of uh, these large networks. Uh, it's a non-trivial task and quantum computers can help us there. Um, there are going to be completely new paradigms in, in programming here. And, and I mean, it's already hard for some of us old dinosaurs to, um, you know, we're, we're stuck in the procedural days. I mean, you know, I've, I've done a little bit of functional programming and that can turn your head. Um, certainly object oriented. I, I'm not you know, I think object oriented programming is basically lying to you because I want to know, uh, you know, who's going to show me an object oriented CPU. Um, it just, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, or rather, it, it seems to work, uh, but sort of how it's, you know, it's kind of a trick. But anyways, um, what quantum computers are, you know, they're really going to change our outlook in terms of how we think about programming, um, how do we uh, make sure that they work? I mean, you know, just you know, being able to write a hello program um, is not going to mean that you understand uh, how uh, quantum computers actually do operate. So in terms of security, we are going to have combinations of classical and quantum devices and operations to increase the complexity of our systems that are already uh, very, very uh, complex. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, the complexity there is, is going to create problems for us. On the other hand, uh, quantum computers uh, with, with <coughs> simulation, uh, with the pattern matching, will probably uh, provide tools for us for troubleshooting. which is a good thing because we will have to be troubleshooting where the problem lies in a system which contains both quantum and classical computers. Uh, so again, uh, you know, it's, it's not gonna be an easy thing to do. <clears throat> uh, insider attacks, the pattern matching capabilities of quantum computers may uh, give us some tools for insider attack detection. Um, that has been a very intractable problem. It's always been an issue, and uh, it's not easy to, to figure out um, who's going to uh, deal with it. Um, so that is, uh, you know, it's an interesting uh, situation, uh, and, and maybe we will get a tool that, that can help us there. Telecommunications and networking. Again, we've mentioned intrusion detection systems and, and the capabilities there. Botnet detection and assessment, and looking at the command and control, the ownership, uh, particularly for fast flux uh, systems. Network attack analysis. All of these things are uh, uh, issues where the tools that quantum computers give us um, can help. Um, yeah. Uh, we're coming to the limitations of, of uh, our spam detection, even with Bayesian analysis. Um, certainly, uh, a number of the systems that I uh, work with regularly, it, it just, um, you know, it, it seems to be a problem. And, and the uh, pattern matching capabilities um, that go along with uh, quantum computing are, are probably uh, areas where uh, you know, we'll, we'll get new spam uh, detection tools in there. Quantum uh, encryption requires special channels, the, the quantum cryptography. Quantum devices, though, are likely to be remote access for the foreseeable future. It's not going to be, you know, uh, we're going to start out with, with centralized systems with um, uh, sort of like time sharing uh, capabilities that uh, you can sign on, you can get uh, something uh, from, you know, pay rent for uh, time on, on the computer. So it's going to be remote access. And again, you know, dealing with uh, telecommunications and, and networking for these situations, particularly as we're um, 
doing some computations with a, a quantum computer and some with classical. That's, there's going to be data flying back and forth and we need to uh, protect that um, and, and perform authentication on who's uh, available to do it. Um, interesting uh, communications channels. Um, the quantum entities that we use for transmission uh, can provide for more than one bit uh, per photon, for example. Uh, one test um, sent enough data for a small graphic image. I, I think it was around 128 bits in one, one photon. Uh, so uh, there's also, um, as I say, the, the possibility of uh, continuously variable entities. So, you know, uh, we have an analog photon, I mean, which is really kind of bizarre because the, the whole point of quantum computing was that um, it was defining stepwise uh, uh, states in uh, entities. Um, so uh, being able to send something at, in an analog situation is, is kind of mind blowing. Um, Quantum networks, um, this is uh, something that I came across recently. I'm not sure uh, about this. Um, I mean, they, they made it work and that sort of thing, but uh, it's probably going to be more uh, local connections in terms of uh, distributed quantum computing uh, rather than large scale uh, networking, at least for the uh, the immediate future. Uh, so it's, that's going to be an interesting field of, of research. And uh, law and investigation, we're going to have new forensic analysis tools, the, the pattern matching and simulation there uh, could be very helpful, but the presentation and acceptance in court, as per the earlier discussion on presenting technical evidence in court is definitely going to be problematic. So, uh, we're going to have to deal with that. And we managed to uh, get through all the slides for that. So 